Welcome to the History AI Podcast, where the past comes alive with facts, anecdotes, and a dash of humor. Here are your hosts, Chuck and Marco. Welcome to the History AI Podcast. I'm Chuck. And I'm Marco. Today, we're diving into a pivotal yet often overlooked event in history, the St. John Slave Revolt of 1733. That's right, Marco. It's a story of struggle, resilience, and a fight for freedom that resonates even today. But before we get into the nitty-gritty, a quick reminder to subscribe, rate, and share our podcast if you enjoy this journey through history. Let's paint a picture of St. John before the revolt. In the early 18th century, St. John was a lesser-known sibling in the Danish West Indies, overshadowed by its neighbors like St. Thomas. That's right. Unlike the bustling ports and thriving commerce in St. Thomas, St. John was more of a backwater. But then, sugar happened. Oh yes, sugar. This was the era when European sweet tooths were transforming the Caribbean into a sugar factory. And St. John, with its fertile hills, was perfect for sugar plantations. But, as we know, sugar plantations meant enslaved labor. The Danes, who controlled the island, started bringing in Africans to work these plantations. Life for these enslaved people was unimaginably harsh. The work was backbreaking. Clearing forests, planting, harvesting cane, all under the Caribbean sun. And the conditions, well, they were atrocious. Not to mention the constant threat of punishment. Whippings, isolation, you name it. The planters were trying to squeeze out every bit of profit, with little regard for human life. And let's not forget the cultural aspect. These enslaved Africans came from diverse backgrounds, different languages, customs, and social structures. But in the crucible of plantation life, they began to forge a new, shared identity. Exactly, Chuck. And among them were the Aquamu, who were once part of a powerful kingdom in present-day Ghana. They had a history of warfare and political organization, skills that would soon become very relevant. So, by the 1730s, you've got a volatile mix on St. John, brutal working conditions, a melting pot of African cultures, and a growing sense of injustice. It was like a powder keg waiting for a spark. And that spark came in November 1733. Now, let's talk about the key figures and the driving forces behind this historic revolt. The revolt was not a spontaneous outburst, it was a calculated rebellion led by individuals who had both the motive and the means to challenge their oppressors. At the forefront were the Aquamu, particularly King June and Brefu. The Aquamu, originally from the Gold Coast, which is modern-day Ghana, had a history of establishing empires and engaging in warfare in Africa. This background played a crucial role in their leadership. King June, who was considered a natural leader among the enslaved community, was known for his charisma and strategic mind. He had been a leader in his community in Africa before being enslaved, and these skills translated into his role in the revolt. Then there was Brefu, a woman of immense bravery and tactical acumen. Her role is particularly noteworthy because, at a time when women were often sidelined, she stood as a central figure in planning and executing the revolt. These leaders harnessed the widespread discontent among the enslaved population. The causes of the revolt were deeply rooted in the brutal conditions of the sugar plantations. Enslaved people were subjected to relentless workloads, harsh physical punishment, and a complete denial of basic human rights. The sugar plantations were essentially death traps, with high mortality rates due to overwork, malnutrition, and disease. Plus, there were the cultural and psychological aspects. Enslaved Africans were stripped of their identities and subjected to a systemic erasure of their heritage. This loss, combined with the inhumane conditions, created a shared sense of despair and anger. Exactly, Chuck. And let's not forget, there was a clear power imbalance. The enslaved outnumbered the planters and soldiers, but they were kept in check through fear and brutal control measures. But it was only a matter of time before the oppressed decided enough was enough. The revolt was a culmination of years of pent-up frustration and a desperate desire for freedom. And when they rose up, they did so with a plan. It wasn't random violence, it was a strategic, organized effort to overthrow their oppressors and claim freedom. All right, let's get into the thick of it, the revolt itself. This wasn't just a rebellion, it was a meticulously planned military operation. It all kicked off on November 23, 1733. 
The rebels chose this day because many of the soldiers and plantation owners were off the island, celebrating the harvest festival in St. Thomas. Talk about perfect timing. The rebels, led by King Jun and Brefu, first seized control of the fort at Coral Bay, Fort Fredericksvern. This was a strategic move, the fort housed the island's main arsenal. They didn't just capture the fort Chuck. They did it with almost theatrical flair. Disguised as soldiers, they tricked their way in and then quickly turned the tables. Once they had the weapons, they moved swiftly. Small groups of rebels fanned out across the island, targeting plantations. Their method was clear, liberate the enslaved, arm them, and recruit them into their growing army. The rebellion spread like wildfire. Within hours, most of the island was in their control. Plantation owners fled or were captured. It was a complete reversal of power, and for the first time, the enslaved were in charge. The rebels knew they had to be quick and decisive. They set up defensive positions, anticipating a counterattack. They weren't just fighting, they were also strategizing. And their strategy was smart. They used the island's terrain to their advantage, the hills, the forests. It was guerrilla warfare, Caribbean style. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. Communication and coordination among various groups of rebels were challenging. And let's not forget, they were up against professional soldiers. True, but for several months, they held their ground. The rebels turned plantations into fortresses and used the fort's weapons to fend off attacks. It's incredible, Marco. For a time, they established what was essentially an independent state, governed by and for the formerly enslaved. As we delve into the end of the St. John's Slave Revolt, we find a tale of resilience pitted against overwhelming odds. Despite the initial success, the rebels faced formidable challenges. By early 1734, word of the revolt had spread far and wide, reaching European shores. The Danish authorities, under pressure to restore order and protect their economic interests, couldn't let this go unchallenged. That's when the big guns, quite literally, came in. A combined force of French and Swiss troops, along with Danish reinforcements, was dispatched to St. John. We're talking about well-armed, well-trained soldiers here. The island turned into a battleground. The European forces, experienced in colonial warfare, began a systematic campaign to reclaim the island. Their strategy? Divide and conquer. And they had another advantage, naval support. The rebels were strong on land, but at sea, they stood no chance against the European warships and their cannons. The rebels, led by King June, Brefu, and others, fought valiantly. They used guerrilla tactics, leveraging their knowledge of the land but the lack of external support and internal divisions began to take a toll. It's worth noting that not all enslaved people joined the revolt. Some remained loyal to their masters, providing crucial intelligence to the European forces. As the months passed, the tide turned. The European forces recaptured the fort and began retaking plantations. The rebels were pushed back into the more inaccessible parts of the island. The final stand came at a plantation in the east. It was a fierce fight, but outnumbered and outgunned, the rebels couldn't hold their ground. The aftermath was brutal. Many of the rebels chose to take their own lives to escape capture. Those rebels that were captured were severely punished, executions, torture, you name it. It was a grim end to a bold uprising. But their fight wasn't in vain. The revolt sent shockwaves through the Caribbean and Europe. It exposed the vulnerabilities of the colonial system and the desperate need for change. It also led to stricter control measures on St. John and other islands, as the authorities sought to prevent any future uprisings. The St. John's Slave Revolt remains a powerful testament to the human desire for freedom and dignity. It's a story of courage against the most daunting of odds. The St. John's Slave Revolt, though ultimately quelled, left a lasting legacy that rippled through history. Let's unpack the far-reaching impacts of this rebellion. First and foremost, the revolt highlighted the inherent instability of the colonial slave system. It demonstrated that enslaved people, when pushed to their limits, were capable of organized resistance. Absolutely, Marco. The fear of similar uprisings led to changes in how European powers governed their colonies. There was a noticeable shift in colonial policies, with authorities implementing stricter control measures. But these measures were a double-edged sword. While they aimed to prevent rebellions, 
they also exposed the brutality and inhumanity of slavery, fueling further dissent and calls for abolition. Speaking of abolition, the revolt had a motivational effect on the burgeoning abolitionist movement in Europe and the Americas. It provided a powerful narrative of enslaved Africans not just as victims, but as active agents in their struggle for freedom. This narrative shift was crucial. It helped to humanize the plight of enslaved people in the public eye, countering the dehumanizing propaganda often spread by pro-slavery factions. And let's not forget the cultural impact. The revolt, and others like it, played a key role in shaping the identity and consciousness of African Caribbean people. It became a symbol of resistance and a source of pride in their heritage. Exactly Chuck. On a broader scale, the revolt contributed to the growing pressure on the European colonial powers to reconsider the ethics and viability of the slave trade and slavery. It also led to an increased militarization and fortification of the Caribbean colonies. The planters and colonial authorities were on high alert, fearing another revolt. In terms of social dynamics, the revolt, to some extent, altered the relationship between enslaved people and their masters. The fear of rebellion made some planters slightly more cautious in their treatment of enslaved individuals. But it's important to note that these changes were not driven by a moral awakening but by fear and pragmatism. The harsh reality is that significant improvement in the conditions of enslaved people didn't come until much later. The legacy of the St. John's Revolt is complex. It's a story of courage and resilience but also a reminder of the dark chapters of human history. It's a chapter that needs to be remembered and learned from. As we close this episode, let's take a moment to reflect on the enduring spirit of those who fought for their freedom on St. John. And with that reflection, we wrap up today's episode. Thanks for joining us on the History AI podcast. Remember to subscribe, rate, and share to help us bring more stories from the past into the present. Until next time, keep exploring history and its lasting impacts. Goodbye, everyone. From the mind behind the History AI podcast comes an electrifying journey into the past. A ripple through time, Franklin's folly. Dive into a tale where Benjamin Franklin, America's beloved inventor, takes an unexpected journey through time. But with his leap, he unleashes a powerful ripple. Now, with dark forces lurking in the shadows, harnessing this energy to shatter and enslave the world, it's a race against time. Will Franklin fix the future? Or will history rewrite itself? Uncover the secrets. A ripple through time, Franklin's folly. Time has never been more fragile. On Amazon now.